kind introduction and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today and tell you about our experiments in Munich, give you a little bit of an insight of what we're doing and uh, some of the latest results, but also some introduction part, you know, why we're doing what we're doing. So I picked out basically three topics. So after introduction into the field, I want to talk about this new revolutionary tool of quantum gas microscopes, which give us really completely new ways of observing quantum matter and probing it. And I want to give you a few examples of that. And then I want to talk about many body localization, as I did mention. And I hope, well, we'll see, actually. I'll make a choice here whether you want to hear about the negative temperatures, which is actually a cool, fun story. I think also for everybody to get back on board again. If I lost you somehow throughout the talk, this is where everybody will be able to enter again. And it's a fun subject. For the students also, and I think it's something where you can then keep on discussing with your lecturers later on in your statistical physics courses about what this guy has been telling you here, if it's all wrong or right or whatever, because you'll actually see, quite surprisingly, this triggered actually quite a big debate among some kind of statistical physicists about you know the concept of negative temperatures. But I'll, I'll, I'll maybe get to that later. OK, so let me start uh, by just outlining why we do what we do, and of course, you know, our, our goal in this field is to understand quantum many body systems in a very broad sense. I mean, this can be a, a material, this can be, you know, any kind of quantum many body system, like say, uh, you know, could be simulations that concern, for example, isolated quantum systems, and isolated quantum systems, the whole universe is an isolated quantum system. So it really addresses, you know, a wide variety <coughs> of questions of these systems, how their emergent properties arise, how their dynamics occurs, and of course, nowadays, uh, and that's part of why you also formed this center here, I guess, at NYU, this, of course, has become also of a tremendous technological impact of, you know, in this new field of quantum technologies, quantum computing, metrology, quantum sensors. I want to take today the more fundamental uh, <coughs> understanding, put that at the center of the talk, and try to see how we can gain insight into that. And we basically build in this research on a lot of previous work of many Nobel Prize winners in the field of quantum optics in basically achieving the ultimate control over <coughs> single atoms, ions, photons, and others over solid state devices. And one of the future goals of our whole field is to build kind of complex machines out of these simple quantum systems, quantum computers, quantum simulators, in our case, to study the behavior of other kind of complex quantum systems that we really cannot uh, study by other means. And the first person to put forth this vision was actually Richard Feynman in a visionary talk in 1981 at MIT he gave. And it's quite remarkable to see actually that he pointed this out already at this early time, even though at that time the experimental capabilities were far below what's available to us today and you know, far beyond you know, putting this into practice in any way. Of course, today the field has moved tremendously, and we can see many <coughs> implementations of such systems in ion traps, um, solid state devices like these superconducting devices, for example, or in our cases, I'll tell you a little bit about these crystal uh, of atoms, our optical lattices in which we load ultra cold atoms. So, in fact, I want to start with that. I want to show you how we create uh, periodic potentials, crystals of light, in which we're able to store the atoms, in which we're going to do the experiments we do. And for that, I would like to show you an experiment that uh, my advisor, my PhD advisor, Ted Hensch, did in his own labs in Munich. So basically a very simple experiment. So he took just a laser beam, expanded the laser beam, sent it through a macroscopic piece of cardboard with two holes in it, and then refocused the laser beam with another telescope. And then you see the resulting pattern, light pattern. And of course, for two openings, you all know very well what you get. It's just a standard double slit experiment. <coughs> and of course, what you get is this beautiful double slit experience, uh, interference pattern on your screen. Now this thing can be changed slightly. Let's just add another hole. And now you immediately see you change from this double slit pattern to a uh, triangular hexagonal lattice. And what you also see, the beautiful thing is this thing is really defect three. There's no defect in this crystal. And we can basically realize uh, optical potentials for the atoms that we're going to load into them that are highly controllable and just created by Fourier synthesis. Here's an even more beautiful pattern. Five openings, a quasi-crystal, where you basically now see again this beautiful interference pattern. So I, I'd like to stress again and again, because this is such a nice pattern, this is not a mathematical plot. This is just optical interference, just a few laser beams interfering and giving rise to this beautiful pattern uh, in which we can load the atoms. And uh, actually, actually, if you want to have a look how these pictures were taken, actually want to have see a lot of other fun optics experiments. So Ted on YouTube, 
Ted Hems on YouTube. So he has the username is superlaser123. Mm -hmm. And he has actually a fantastic series of optics lectures on there. So I really encourage you to go and have a look at that. It's really fun. So our challenge is to now place kind of atoms in there. So we cool atoms to extremely low temperatures so they can be really held by these optical crystals in free space and move in them and through quantum mechanical motion and study the <coughs> physics of these interacting particles in these optical potentials. We do this typically, as you'll see, with a few hundred to a thousand particles in larger systems, 3D systems with up to a million particles. And we can do that with um, basically spin systems, so qubits, uh, spin up and down. But uh, I think more importantly, we can do this also directly for bosons, bosonic particles, fermionic particles, which emulate the motion of electrons, for example, in a solid, or mixtures of both. And that's actually very important because it means you can now study things like material science problems or maybe in the future quantum chemistry problems without mapping them onto a spin Hamiltonian. And actually, I'll show you examples where we can do this already today in regimes which are computationally intractable on classical computers. And that's one of the goals of this research. All right, so how can we do solid state physics in these gases? And I remind you, the gases we're talking about are extremely dilute. They're about five orders of magnitude more dilute than the air surrounding us. So how come we study condensed matter physics in them? And well, here I've sketched a real material. It's small, so you can barely see it. And the way how to look into this material is, of course, to build better and better microscopes. OK? Yeah, don't worry. It's <laughs> 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 small, small. But, but somebody should turn off the light. Yeah, maybe we can turn off one of them. Okay. Which one is it? This one? Yeah, OK. Okay, do you see it? Yeah. 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 That's, that's the real material. It's <laughs> small. Uh, as angstrom sizes. And in order to look into this real material, you know, people in Hamburg, for example, build these beautiful XFEL sources or these new light sources, advanced light sources at Stanford, to look into those materials. We are taking a radically different approach. We are saying, okay, why not scale everything in this material up by a factor of 10,000? So everything that's angstrom size scale here becomes micrometer scale here. And now, suddenly, that's, you know, then you can just use good optics. I mean, micrometer, that's resolvable by very good microscope. You can now use just microscope objective to look into this artificial material. Now, of course, we know that matter doesn't allow us to do that normally with the material. So we have to do it through these artificial crystals that we generate. There's actually another advantage of doing that, uh, doing this approach. Uh, there's also a price to pay, which I'll come to in a second. The another advantage is remembering quantum mechanics when you scale up length scales, energy scales go down. So everything that's actually happening also here on the time dynamics in the femtosecond, attosecond regime over here happens actually in a millisecond time scales. Okay, so actually everything is dramatically slowed down. Every process of a real material is slowed down in the system to kind of millisecond time scale so you can actually conveniently study the real time dynamics of these many body quantum systems uh, with this approach. Now how come you ask why, how come you can study the physics of a many body quantum system there? Well you see in quantum mechanics the only thing that matters is uh, for this to occur is the ratio of the Broglie wavelength of our particles to the interparticle distance <coughs> between them. And if the interparticle distance is about a micrometer Okay, that's what I said. We scale things up by a factor of 10,000. That means we just have to scale up lambda also by the same factor of 10,000 to get the same ratio. And then we have the same ratio of lambda over d as in a maybe strongly interacting electronic material, which typically lives at densities of 10 to the 24 atoms per <coughs> cubic centimeters. But we now realize in a system which has 10 orders of magnitude lower density. <coughs> now, where's the price? Where's the catch? Well, we have to make lambda 10,000 times bigger, I said, right? Well, to make lambda 10,000 times bigger, I have to go to very, very low temperatures. Remember, that scales inversely proportional to the square root of the temperature, the de Broglie wavelength. So I have to go to enormously low temperatures in the nanokelvin, microkelvin regime to achieve those kind of long de Broglie wavelengths to make that work. And that's what basically the field has been able to do with cold atoms to create these right starting conditions to reach this lambda over d so that you can do these experiments. So one other thing I want to stress, what's so nice about these systems, and here's actually a picture of the glass cell in which we do these experiments. So this is a vacuum chamber, and that's what we use for thermal insulation against the environment. Okay, so there's nothing cool to liquid nitrogen or helium temperatures here. The whole apparatus is at room temperature. 
and this cold gas cloud of micro Kelvin temperature sits two millimeters behind this glass wall in this vacuum system. Okay. Uh, you actually should think what happens, what about uh, black body radiation, is that a problem or not? Think about it, we can come back to it if you want to know about it in the question section. But actually I think it's really remarkable to think that this whole thing is room temperature and just two, milli two millimeters here behind this glass wall held by, for example, magnetic forces from these coils or optical forces, we have this like super cold gas clouds. So one other thing that's important for statistical physics or for the uh, experiments on many body localization that we're doing, this system is not connected to a thermal reservoir. So it's a truly isolated quantum system, mm -hmm. as good as we can make them in the lab. It's not totally isolated. No, any experimental system can be completely isolated, but it's the best isolated system we know today. And that means we can actually study a lot of interesting questions on this isolated quantum system. So we can ask, for example, how does temperature emerge in this isolated quantum system? How come you can shake it around, create a highly excited state, and still have the system described in most of the time so successfully by statistical physics and thermodynamics? Well, things are <laughs> not as easy in the lab as they sound. You know, that's the uh, scale everything up by a temperature of 10,000, they're easy. But to do it in practice uh, requires actually a lot of uh, optics and lasers. This is maybe one of our most complex setups that we have. It's actually not the, even the actual experiment. This is just the table, optical table, where we have all the lasers that create the light that is used to create these crystals, to manipulate the atoms, to observe them. And this light is guided through these fibers to another table where the vacuum chamber is that I showed you on the picture before. And uh, well, if you, you know, when the school pupils, school children come to visit our labs, they usually think this is the storage room for the optics. I <laughs> 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 have to warn them that yeah, it's not the storage room, and please do not touch a single mirror and turn on it, because if you touch a single mirror, then the whole experiment doesn't work anymore. And then, of course, you know, that's, that will be bad, and then the good graduate students have to find again which mirror uh, was turned. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you also see, I mean, if you really, uh, this is like a Lego system, okay? I mean, for sure, there's tremendous potential to shrink this down if you're an engineer, an optics engineer, but we're not optics engineers, and we'd like to reconfigure the apparatus very often, so that's why it's more like this Lego block system that we have on our tables. Now, what kind of physics can you study? I'll show you examples of condensed <coughs> matter applications, but I think one other remarkable fact is that if you're actually coming from high-energy physics, turns out that we can also look at uh, physics from uh, high-energy quantum field theories in these systems. For example, one question we looked at is does the Higgs particle exist in a two-dimensional world? So it's, it's an academic question, I agree, but actually dimensionality we know in physics is an important thing to understand, and actually turns out that this problem in 2D is a very, very difficult mathematical problem that to date has not been solved analytically. So we only have approximate solutions to this, and there were conflicting results out in the literature, so we said we'll do an experiment. Now, of course, we don't create real Higgs particles, but we create collective nodes, excitations, which behave like Higgs particles in a relativistic quantum field theory. And then we can study whether these excitations exist in a two-dimensional world. Uh, I'll come back to the negative temperatures, uh, which brought us to the foundations even of statistical mechanics, to this treatise of Gibbs, uh, which I'll actually maybe come back then in the latter part of the talk. What I want to actually focus on now is, is kind of the guinea pig model of electronic strongly correlated, strongly interacting electronic systems, and how we can hope to contribute to solving some of the puzzles associated with that. So here I've uh, plotted a phase diagram of the, the cuprates, experimental phase diagram, and uh, in which high TC superconductivity occurs upon doping the system. And we know that these strongly interacting electronic systems for zero doping basically show nice antiferromagnetism. That's well understood. But once you start doping the system, then a lot of these very complicated phases occur. And really, there's some understanding, but I would say we're far from uh, completely understanding this phase diagram, especially finding a minimal model which gives rise to this D-wave super superconducting dome that we see here for these kind of doping rings. So one of the models that people believe has a strong connection to this, which contains the essential physics, is the so-called Fermi-Hubbard model. So you basically take an electron, two electrons, <coughs> which spin up and down. They repulsively interact. They can move on a lattice, and you have repulsive interactions between them and tunneling, and that's basically the model. So it turns out that this model uh, we can implement very nicely with the atoms in the lattice. So the role of the electron is taken by fermionic isotopes of atoms where different Zeeman substates, 
correspond to different spin states of your electrons. And you can actually very nicely map this system onto this Fermi Hubbard model. It's a very clean realization of this Fermi Hubbard model, which in the case without hole doping, actually for strong repulsion, gives a nice antiferromagnetic Heisenberg uh, model with antiferromagnetic ordering in the system. And what you want to understand when you try to understand this, this phase diagram is really the competition of introducing these holes into the system and this magnetic ordering. And it might seem, again, a simple problem. It turns out this has kept the solid state community busy uh, for the last 30, 40 years, actually, this problem. And it's still not solved. All right. So before we turn to looking at this specific problem, let me tell you a little bit about our tools of trade and this wonderful new tool of quantum gas microscopy. And in order to explain that to you, let me just write down a many-body wave function of a maybe complicated many-body interacting state. Uh, that you have in your material or realized by our atoms in the lattice. And in general, we can write it as a superposition of different configurations of those particles. Of course, there would be complex amplitudes in front of this as well with the probability <coughs> given by the norm squared of those um, amplitudes. Now, what happens? Imagine you would have a camera which can take a photo of such a system with a resolution of single lattice sites and the sensitivity of detecting single particles. So for a solid, this would mean you can make a camera which can really take a photo of your electrons in your solid and record the position of each individual electron in the system. Tell you which ones spin up, which ones spin down, where are they sitting at a given point in time. Okay. So in this many-body system, what happens if you do such a measurement, if you would have such an apparatus, is that the wave function collapses onto one of the configurations. Which one you don't know, it's completely random. Yeah? You only know with a certain likelihood you might get this one. The next time you prepare psi and measure it, you might get this one, or you might get this one. But now you see you have access to single snapshots of your quantum many body system, and that's a very powerful way now of revealing the intricate correlations that can exist in such systems. Because once you have access to such single quantum snapshots of the system, you can ask questions like the following. For example, how, are the, how is the presence of two particles over here? and one over here correlated with having a hole in between. That's a three-point correlation function. Okay. Such a correlation function already you cannot access anymore with standard condensed matter physics tools. And I'll show you actually examples of that where that's highly relevant to characterizing you know, complex correlated states and opening a completely new tool to probe these systems. So here's a, a picture of how this looks like. You know, I talked about the atoms in the lattice. So we make a two-dimensional plane out of a 1D lattice in the vertical direction. And then we add lattices in the x and y direction. And we create a certain phase of matter in this, this two-dimensional plane. And when we want to observe uh, the system, we want to measure it, we shine in a near-resonant laser beam with an atomic transitions. We make the atoms fluoresce. And this moment when they start to fluoresce is precisely the moment where the wave function collapses onto one of these configurations. And here's actually a picture for a thermal gas. Uh, so it's not so interesting yet from a quantum perspective, but shows uh, you know, the nice, uh, beautiful single atom sensitivity we have and resolving, being able to resolve single lattice size. So each bright spot that you see here is a single atom held in this crystal of light that I described to you before. Okay? That's one of those snapshots. And you can see we have this tremendous signal-to-noise ratio in resolving these atoms in the lattice. We can also control atoms on this lattice. We can shine a laser beam on a specific atom, let's say this one, and rotate its spin into any direction you want, for example. And then just to show that this works nicely, you know, we made just a few distinct patterns. Uh, and one I like best is, of course, this Psi. As a quantum physicist, are made out of 26 atoms held in this optical crystal. Okay, So if we really have individual atom control in these systems with a resolution of about 50 nanometers, Remember, the spacing of lattice sites is about half a micron, so much better than the lattice spacing in the system. One thing we're also working towards is uh, basically realizing almost arbitrary potential configurations that you can expose the atoms to and give the system a very high degree of programmability in terms of what potentials you actually realize. So what we use for that is actually a digital mirror device that's most likely up also in this projector up there. So it's an array of micro mirrors that you can turn on and off and project basically object images, like the one I'm showing here, onto the atoms in our case. So you could realize, for example, a tunnel barrier, a thin tunnel barrier through which the atoms tunnel. 
you could realize exotic lattices, exotic lattices or you could realize uh, two reservoirs, you know, two boxes. These are two light boxes. One you could fill up with atoms. And then you can study how they flow through this quantum wire of light into this other box, through this one-dimensional uh, wire. Okay? Or you can make a box potential. So you can run wild with your imagination. If this works well, this method, we can project basically arbitrary patterns onto the atoms and realize arbitrary um, um, potential configurations for them. All right. Let me turn to this Fermi Hubbard model now and show you some of the results that we've achieved over the last uh, two years in this respect. And I have to say, uh, 2016 and 2017 have been really breakthrough techniques in adapting this uh, quantum gas microscopes to fermionic quantum gases in different labs, uh, also here very successfully in the US. So the first thing I want to show is a picture <coughs> of a Fermi gas. So these are spin up and down fermions. Uh, site resolve with single atom sensitivity. You can see sometimes there's a hole. Sometimes when there's more fluorescence, there are two atoms actually sitting there. Okay. Uh, y but you see actually when we take such an image, which is actually a mod insulating state of those fermions, you can see that because on average this occupation is unit filled. A few holes in there, but these can be quantum or thermal defects in the system. But from a kind of measurement perspective, what's not so nice yet is that we do not resolve where the spins are. Okay, so we see the charge in a condensed matter language. I remember when I talk about charge, this actually means for us density because our atoms are neutral, so they have no charge, but in order to make the analogy speak the same language as a condensed matter physicist, I'll talk about charge. Uh, but the spin is not resolved. You don't see the spin. So one thing you can actually do is actually now have a new detection technique where you can actually coherently split the pictures uh, in a controlled stern gala separation to move the spin downs into a separate line here and the spin ups into a separate line here. So now, out of these pictures, you can fully reconstruct the spin and charge distribution of your particles in the original 2D lattice. So for those of you who are theorists who are doing quantum Monte Carlo simulations, you get your snapshot of a certain kind of quantum Monte Carlo picture. This is precisely that, but now not a simulation. This is a real physical system. Okay, you really get full spill and charge resolution of the entire system, and that's going to be important in what follows. So what can you measure with this? Let's go to a 1D system, for example, and study uh, antiferromagnetic correlations in an undoped 1D system. And the way to do that is to use a standard two-point correlator where you correlate the spin on site I with a spin on site I plus V, for example. And um, actually, here's a nice picture of that showing kind of correlations of the system, extending to about something like 10 lattice sites. Remember, in 1D, we never have long-range order. So in, in 1D, even at a temperature t equals 0, we always have algebraically decaying correlations, although in this case, we're still limited mostly by temperature, actually. And also, in the following, what I want to show you, here's a single snapshot. Sometimes we should see a shot like this. This would be actually a classical nail state where you have down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up of your spins, okay? Actually, this state, this classical state, is, has very low contribution in Heisenberg antiferromagnet, which this state has no entanglement. It's a purely classical state, whereas the ground state of the Heisenberg model has a lot of entanglement. But actually, I will use this picture even though it actually occurs very seldom for a Heisenberg antiferromagnet this single snapshot very often to, to, to explain what follows to uh, conceptualize some of the ideas of the behavior of these, these antiferromagnetic systems. So keep in mind when I show these pictures of up, down, up, down, up, down, what I always mean is like truly quantum antiferromagnetic systems. All right, the first experiment I want to talk about is the question of uh, taking an electron, uh, conceptually now, which carries two quantum numbers. It has a charge minus E and spin one half and ask whether we can actually break up the electron into two particles which carry separate quantum numbers of the electron. So can we make a particle which only carries the charge quantum number and only a particle with the spin quantum number of the electron? But you know, in free space, an electron is an elementary particle. This is not possible. We can't do that. Okay. However, if I do this in a solid, this gives rise to the fundamental phenomena of fractionalization. You just replace this word particle by quasi-particle. And then you can do it. You can inject an electron, for example, in this condensed matter system. 
And you can see in uh, several instances what happens, it breaks up into two quasi-particle excitations, which can independently carry the two quantum numbers of the original electron. And what's interesting, in several occasions, actually these also deconfine in this <coughs> fractionalization process, meaning they can separate over arbitrary distances from each other. So you can really separate the two properties into two new elementary particles of the system. Okay, so there are many examples of that in a fractional quantum Hall states, for example, but the most celebrated one, the simplest one, actually occurs precisely in these 1D chains. And um, this is what I want to explain to you in a second. So here we, <coughs> instead of injecting a particle, I actually remove a particle <coughs> of my electrons on my chain, which you can also see is basically injecting an anti-electron with the opposite spin quantum number into the system. So Conceptually, it's precisely the same thing. I could run through the same argument also injecting a true electron, and then we can see what happens. So let's say we have this antiferromagnetic chain. We uh, remove one particle, and then we let the system evolve. When we let the system evolve, what actually happens <coughs> is that you see precisely <coughs> what I said. You get a hole. This hole carries no spin, but carries actually charge one positive charge relative to the background, which has minus E charge. OK, this is a positively charged object. And it also leaves behind this spin-on excitation of spin 1 half over here. Okay, So you have this fractionalization of this original elementary particle that you injected here into a holon or charge-on and a spin-on excitation in the system. The lepton number is carried by the uh, charge or the lepton number, which is independent? Uh -huh. The lepton number is a good question. I would be, I guess, would be carried by the charge. Yeah, it would be carried by the charge. Yes, yes, yes. If you inject an extra <coughs> electron, for sure, it would be carried by the charge. Yes. Um, what's also interesting in this instance is that these velocities with which these two objects move is quite different. Actually, this hole in this one D setting has a completely different velocity and can separate separate arbitrary over arbitrary distances relative to the spin excitation from the system, which can again have a very different um, uh, velocity in the system. That's what we call a dynamical spin charge separation, which occurs when we kick out or inject an extra particle into the system. So just as I want to show some recent data where we actually have seen this process, precisely this process, I think for the first time in real space and time resolved pictures, there have been a lot of beautiful spectroscopic results, uh, also I think very prominent results in the, in the group of Ami Yakobi in, in Harvard on that, but here, we, for, I think for the first time, we can really do this fundamental experiment, like in a textbook. We can really kick out a particle at a certain site. We can see how the hole spreads out over time. But I can also see how the antiferromagnetic correlations are modified by the spin-on propagating in the system. So these are the C1 correlators, the next neighbor spin-spin correlators. You see everything dark blue means strong antiferromagnetic correlations. That's the background. And then you remove one particle, and you could see how the spin-on kind of propagations, these spin-on excitations propagate out. And if we just measure the velocities of those two, you can precisely see what I showed you before conceptually. You can beautifully see this spin and charge separation propagating at very different velocities and completely independently from each other in the system. Okay? So that's a very nice example of showing directly this fractionalization process in these real time and uh, space resolved images. I want to connect this question actually to an interesting question of what the nature of this kind of ground state of the system is, of the dope ground state of the system. So we go back to the 1D chain and we ask, if I don't kick out a hole or introduce a new particle, but very gently introduce holes or extra particles into the system, <coughs> what is the nature of the ground state of the system? And that's again the question we want to understand also then for 2D systems I'll come to in a second in the con connection to high TC superconductivity. So if we go through that, if we have holes in the system and uh, <coughs> spins, we have basically two things to minimize the energy. Holes are like particles, and they want to minimize the kinetic energy, so they want to delocalize. Okay? Holes want to delocalize. On the other hand, the spins, they want to basically align antiferromagnetically in this model to minimize magnetic energy costs in the system. And we have to kind of accommodate the two and find the best solution that accommodates those two kind of constraints. And the best one one can write down for the ground state is the following notion, <laughs> again in this cartoon way, where you have the hole being in a coherent superposition of everywhere on this chain. So the hole is coherently delocalized over the chain. And actually, quite surprisingly, it favors an alignment where across a hole, 
you basically have antiferromagnetic order. So the parity of this antiferromagnet is flipped by the presence of the hole. And that's different from just removing the particle. Remember, if I just removed, there was a spin down particle here. If I just removed it, I would actually have ferromagnetic correlations across, across this hole. So the ground state is of this nature that minimizes kind of those two constraints. So this is the first thing to, to understand that whenever you have a hole, it acts like a domain wall, a quantum domain wall, because the hole can be anywhere, right? It's not a fixed wall. It moves. It's mobile. It can be anywhere on that chain. And whenever there's a hole, the hole, it not only has a local effect, it actually has a very global effect on the 1D system because it flips the parity of the entire antiferromagnetic background. When I say parity, I just mean these two configurations of, for example, down, up, down, up, and up, down, up, down. Okay? And whenever there's a hole, this parity is flipped by minus 1 in the system. Now, um, you can see that. We've measured that. And here's kind of a picture of the data. This is kind of one of the first measurements which make use of this three-point correlation. So what I'm showing here is the following. I'm measuring the spin on site I, how the spin is oriented on site I, correlated with the spin on site I plus D. But now I condition it on having a hole at site I plus S. So it's a three-point correlation function. Okay? And now S has two options. S can either be beyond the two spins, so it's outside of the two spins, or it's inside the two spins. And if it's inside the two spins, remember the parity will be flipped. If it's outside the two spins, the parity will not be flipped in the system. And you can see that. You can see that this not only has a local effect, but you can really see, if I plot here the distance between the spins, the position of the hole, that you have this down, up, down, up, down, up staggering. But if you have the hole kind of now in between, red turns to blue and uh, blue to red. So you precisely flip the sign of the antiferromagnetic correlations on a global scale. All right, that's a single hole, but now you're ready to understand what arbitrary holes do to the system in one dimension. So now you just introduce many, many holes into the system, and each time you introduce a hole, remember, we learned there was just a parity flip from plus to minus one sign. So that's what, what these holes do. And now you stare at this picture a little bit longer, and you actually look at it, look at it, look at it, and you think, well, somehow, if I could squeeze out the holes, then actually this looks like a perfect antiferromagnetic end. And I have a perfectly antiferromagnetically ordered system back. If I could just somehow go to a fictitious lattice, which is <coughs> represented by the occupied lattice mm -hmm. sites, pushed together on this fictitious one-dimensional lattice. Okay? And this is actually a very fundamental phenomena in, in 1D. This is what we learned about dynamical spin charge separation showing up in the excitation properties of the system, this actually shows up as a fundamental feature in the ground state of this many-body system. So you might think this is actually a very complicated problem. Turns out the wave function is beautifully simple, and this was found out for the first time in uh, beta ansatz results here by Wojnarowicz and Ogata and Shiba in the 80s and 90s, that basically you can write this many-body wave function uh, uh, as basically a product wave function of the charge in the system. So these are spinless fermions that define the position of our electrons on the n side lattice. So this just carries the information where the spins are. And this is the magnetic part. This is m smaller than n. This is now this squeeze space lattice. So this tells you how the electrons are ordered on this fictitious lattice, uh, which has a um, shorter length than the original physical lattice. So you have this pro factorization into a charge part, a spinless fermion part, and a magnetic part in the ground state wave function of this many-body problem. There's another way to see this, or to analyze the problem, that connects to a so-called non-local order parameter. Remember, I want to correlate. I want to see if this spin is correlated with this spin over here. My problem is that there can be arbitrary number of holes in between. If you Each time there's a hole, the number of parity flips by plus or minus one. So if you have a fluctuating number of holes and you don't know how many, <coughs> this spin over here will wobble plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, and you will not be able to tell whether it's correlated with this spin. However, if you know how many holes there are in between those two spins, then each time there's a hole, you can flip the correlation function by minus one. And this is what this object does. It's basically a non-local kind of now correlator, which allows us to reveal correlations between the spin here on side zero, the spin over here at side D, taking into account that each time there's a hole, there's a parity flip in the antiferromagnetic background.
And you can see this is the very, a very beautiful extension of the normal kind of order parameters we introduce in condensed matter physics, but in a subtle way. Usually we don't have this thing in the middle. We just have this two-point correlator defining our Landau order parameter, <coughs> so kind of standard Landau order that we have uh, in the system. But here, in order to reveal this order that is present in the system, you actually have to have a global view on the system. You have to know not only what's going on here and here, you have to know what's going on on all the lattice sites in between. And in that sense, people call this a hidden order parameter and never thought this could be ever measured in an experiment. Of course, theorists like to use it, but uh, and no experiment could ever kind of resolve what's going on on all the lattice sites in between those two points. But of course, now with the quantum gas microscopes, we have a wonderful tool to analyze this in the experiment. So let me show you some data on this. So here's a two-point correlation result for the spin-spin correlations of <coughs> different doping levels from about 10% doping to 70% doping. And the only thing, if you see this data, is that, OK, when the spins are right next to each other, <coughs> they are antiferromagnetically aligned. They are negative spin correlations. But beyond that, there's absolutely no structure in this data. So if you see this as an experimentalist, you would say, well, this thing is not an, not an antiferromagnet. I don't see any antiferromagnetic order in this system. However, if you now take into account and measure where the holes are as well, and take them into account in your string correlator analysis, now you see that you can reveal these antiferromagnetic hidden correlations that are present in the system and show that there indeed is this more complex, more intricate correlations in the system that only reveal themselves through these kind of hidden order parameters. All right, let me briefly show now what happens in 2D because the physics of 2D is closer, of course, to the superconductors and it's totally different from what you heard in 1D, okay? So this is the antiferromagnet. I'm sorry if this picture makes you dizzy a little bit, but <laughs> it's a difficult <laughs> problem. So it's a lot of entanglement there, so it you know, makes you dizzy. But that's what we want to understand, right? We have this antiferromagnetic background, and we put holes in it. We want to understand what's going on. It turns out that already the question of a single hole in this antiferromagnetic background is actually a very tough problem. And that it's a tough, tough cookie. You can actually already see by some of the people who worked on this or found this paper uh, from, I think, two, three of the greatest minds in theoretical condensed matter physics today, uh, Charlie Kane, Philip Kim, and Nick Reed. So it's very rare to have a combination of such three authors on one paper, and who precisely looked at this kind of Gedanken experiment, motion of a single hole in a quantum antiferromagnet. That's precisely the question they asked. What's going to happen if I have a single hole in this quantum antiferromagnet? And we can just go through the same arguments again than before. We have this competition of delocalization. The hole wants to get rid of its, minimize the kinetic energy by delocalizing. But we have this magnetic order cost we have to satisfy as well. And now, instead of inserting a hole or removing a particle, I actually want to put in an excess particle but uh, which is what we realized in the experiment, but it turns out to be exactly the, the same problem. So imagine we put in another particle here, and now this moves now through the system. It moves one lattice side to the right, and you see as it moved one lattice side to the right, it left behind a string of flipped spins where instead of antiferromagnetic order here, you now have ferromagnetic order, so that costs you energy. Now let's move a bit more. Let's move one step <coughs> further to the right, and you can see immediately, well, now it leaves behind even more flipped spins, okay? So you can immediately see that in contrast to the 1D situation where the hole or the doublon can move arbitrarily far from the spin on, here it cannot be the case because the magnetic energy cost will rise and rise and rise the further this particle moves. So it has to kind of slow down. It cannot, or it cannot propagate over the entire system. Or, well, it actually two choices what this system could choose to do. In order for the hole or the doublon to move easier in the antiferromagnet, it could basically happen that the single hole or single dopant reduces antiferromagnetic correlations in the entire system and makes it overall easier to move. Or it makes a bubble around itself. And within this bubble, within this polaron bubble here, it kind of reduces the antiferromagnetic correlations or make them even ferromagnetic so it can move easily within <coughs> this locally ferromagnetic or strongly reduced antiferromagnetic background. Okay? But that would mean that we have this modification of the antiferromagnetic background <coughs> tied to this impurity and this is the polaron solution. So uh, you can go through different calculations and there have been uh, different people who use different models to, to, to do that. 
In a very simple few line calculation, you can immediately come up with the size of such an object should be the ratio of the bare tunneling to the super exchange magnetic energy cost in the system to the fourth root. Uh, it gives you kind of a rough scaling of how that should scale if the polaron is the right solution. So indeed, we can do this experiment and now find these dopants, find with a microscope the sites where we have double occupancy, and that can be anywhere in the system. Remember, that's a mobile object. It can roam around in the system, and if we just find one, we center the coordinate system on that, and then we measure what are the correlations around this double. Okay? So these are magnetic correlations between this spin, this spin, this spin, and this spin, indicated by the bonds, and the color tells you how strong the antiferromagnetic correlations are. And you can already see from the C1 correlator here that we see a reduction or a change modification of the uh, magnetic environment around this doubly occupied site. In the diagonal one, it's even more striking. The diagonal one even shows a complete sign reversal. So the background shows these positive uh, spin correlations, whereas in the vicinity of the doublon, we have like antiferromagnetic correlations. So there's a complete sign reversal in this vicinity of this doublon in the system. And we can do this even over larger distances, C2 correlators, uh, which are a bit more complicated. But I think what's beautiful is that we now have a completely model independent microscopic characterization of the spin correlations around such a mobile impurity. Now you could ask, is the mobility really crucial? So let's do a test experiment. Let's pin the, pin the impurity. Let's actually take a laser beam, focus it on that kind of dopant, and make its mass so heavy that it can't move anymore. So we basically quench the kinetic energy of this impurity and ask, is the situation different? So let's do the experiment. And this is the outcome, the mobile doublon, the pin doublon. And you can see in the pin doublon, apart from statistical fluctuations, we can't really see any significant modification of the spin correlations around this impurity. It's really the mobility together with the dopant that's actually crucial for modifying this antiferromagnetic background and forming this polaron in the, in the case. And of course, you know, now we can go one step further. I think for future experiments, we're now thinking about introducing several dopants and now see how do these kind of polarons interact with each other. How do you, for example, do you have attraction or repulsion between them? Do you get stripe phase formation from them when you have many of them? So I think we can start up from this microscopic picture and build up and see how this quasi-particle nature is lost and how kind of new phases of matter emerge from that. All right, um, how are we doing in time? Okay, so now you have to make the decision. Should we talk here the many body localization or the, the negative temperature part? So who's for the both? Oh. Oh. Tem temperature. <laughs> I fear we won't make it through both because I really don't want to go over time in my, in my system. So let's make a small vote. Who wants to hear about many body localization? Who <laughs> wants to hear about negative temperatures? All right, so negative temperatures it is. <laughs> and the ones who want to hear about many body localization can ask me about that. Okay, all right, so let's, let's talk about the negative absolute temperatures and um, come back. First of all, let me, you know, when we talk about temperature, it's important to put it on a good definition, because everybody probably has a feeling if I ask in the round, what, what is temperature? I might, might get quite different answers actually to that question. So I think if we just go to thermodynamics and ask thermodynamics, well, from, uh, we would say that's just basically the derivative of entropy versus energy gives us one over T. No? Um, now, that is fine even if we DSDE would be negative. Typically, DSDE is, of course, positive. You know, when we heat up our uh, kettle of water, uh, we put energy in, we generate entropy. But there could be systems where this is negative, and that's actually, actually, actually usually also fine. So thermodynamic theorems apply actually in both cases. One warning where you get a problem already when you associate temperature with kind of an average energy content of the system. So your equipartition theorem on half kBT, then it's going to be a little bit tricky. So let's stick with this more fundamental thermodynamic um, definition of entropy, of temperature, sorry. All right, so let's take now a many-body system and look how we populate in thermal equilibrium those, those energy levels. And uh, well, that's just given then this by this kind of um, Boltzmann factor, where this is the energy of the many-body state, T is the temperature, <coughs> and that function is fine. You can normalize that function if you have a lowest energy state in the system. 
okay, if the spectrum is bounded from below. If it wouldn't be bounded from below, you would have a problem normalizing this function. But that's okay because we know the quantum system has a ground state, so it's always bounded from below, and that's, that works. Now, let's just, you know, just replace t by minus t. That means now you have an exponentially <coughs> increasing uh, distribution over the many body states. And that would work in a case, again, if you want to normalize it, if you have an upper bound in the energy spectrum of the system. So you have to have a maximum energy bound in the system. All right? And now, this is, of course, not a new topic. You probably taught it in statistical mechanics or heard about it before. And it's basically uh, has been uh, discussed a lot in the case of spin systems. And a beautiful <coughs> treaty actually that discusses this was uh, published already in 1956 by one of the AMO heroes, actually Norman Ramsey. And I highly recommend this paper. It's a wonderful actually paper on the thermodynamics and statistical mechanics at uh, negative absolute temperature. But he already noted at the time, you know, that these negative temperatures are conditions for it are so restrictive that these are rarely met in practice except with some mutual interacting nuclear spin systems. And this is, of course, where the first experiments by Purcell and Pound, for example, were done in. And it's easy to see for a spin system in a magnetic field that this works, actually, because, for example, we just put spin one-halves in a, in a magnetic field. We have a lowest energy state, so we have a minimum energy bound, which we need for positive temperature, uh, but we also have all spins pointing down, which is a maximum energy level, so we have an upper energy bound. So you can have negative absolute temperature also in the system. So that's, that's fine, and that's what people made use of. And then there were further experiments also in antiferromagnetic systems by the famous, uh, by the famous low temperature labs in fin Finland by uh, Lunasma and, and the others. And there were also experiments in ultra cold atoms working. Now, I want to ask a different question. I want to ask, can you realize negative absolute temperatures, not for spin systems, but really for a gas like the gas surrounding us? And what does it mean to have such a negative absolute temperature in a gas of moving particles? Okay. So what do we have to do, and what are the properties of such a gas? All right, so let's look at our Hamiltonian. Remember, we have, in this case, I'm talking about bosons in a lattice. Uh, so we basically have three terms uh, that are important to us. This term describes the hopping, the tunneling motion of the bosons on the lattice, hopping from site I to the neighboring site J. This term describes the interactions between the particles. If U is positive, these are repulsive interactions, and Ni just counts the number of bosons on that site. And then in our experiments, we typically also have a trapping potential, an overall <coughs> harmonic trap, which keeps the atoms confined to a certain region in space. So these are the three terms in the Hamiltonian. And for each one, we have to check, does it fulfill the conditions for positive and negative temperatures in the system? Okay. So for kinetic energy, if I'm confining myself to the lowest energy band of the system, it's good because I have a lowest energy bound and an upper energy bound of the system. For interaction energy, for repulsive interactions, if U is positive, I have a lower energy bound when all the particles are separated from each other and there's zero interaction energy cost. Uh, but no bound from above, so this is also good for positive temperatures, but not for negative temperatures. And my for potential energy in the system, uh, you know, I have a minimum here when all the particles are in the center, and then the energy increases, so that's also good for positive temperatures, but not for negative temperatures. So here is a system where we can realize positive temperatures. Question is, what would I have to do to make the system negative temperatures possible in this system? Well, kinetic energy is fine again, for interactions, I would actually have to go to attractive interactions, because then interaction energy is bounded from above, but not from below. And for potential energy, I would have to go from a trap to an anti-trap, such again that energy is bounded from above and not from below. Okay? So that's what you have to do for negative temperature. This is what you have to do for positive temperature. Let's just quickly look for this gas of atoms for the kinetic energy part what we mean by that by just plotting the, the entropy of the system as a function of its energy in the band. If all the bosons are in the ground state of the band, forming a Bose-Einstein condensate, we have a minimum energy state with zero entropy. Likewise, if all the atoms are at the upper band point of my energy band, we again have a Bose-Einstein condensate, a pure state, but now at maximum energy. So entropy is zero again here at the maximum <coughs> energy state. And of course, when we distribute Suddenly, all those particles across the uh, different uh, energy levels here equally, for example, then we have the maximum entropy state in the system. So the curve somehow must look like this. 
And then remember, one over t is the SDE. So I just take the derivative the SDE, and you see here this derivative is positive, going from plus zero to plus infinity temperature here. And there's a jump from plus infinity to minus infinity over here. And then it goes back to minus uh, zero degree Kelvin over here. Okay. So you might be worried is about what about this uh, kind of jump here? Well, I would say it's an artifact of the definition of temperature. If we would have chosen beta, for example, of our as our parameter to characterize temperature, so one over kVT, then this would just run continuously from minus infinity to plus infinity over here. So now the question is, what is hotter than what? Okay, well what do you even mean? So what do we mean by hot hotness physically for in physics? Yeah? Hotness uh, basically characterizes the the when when you connect two two systems, the hotter one is always the one that gives up heat from which heat flows to the colder one. That's how we characterize which system is hotter than another one. So in this sense, these negative temperature states are hotter than any positive temperature state because when you connect a negative one to a positive one, heat will always flow from the negative one to the positive one. Okay, that's number one to learn. So negative temperatures are always hotter than the hottest possible uh, positive temperature you can have in nature. Okay, all right. How to get there? How do we do it, actually? Okay. Well, okay, so here's a trick that we do using making use of this so-called superfluid mod transition. So we start out with the Bose-Einstein condensate <coughs> of bosons in the slowest kinetic energy state. Then we crank up the lattice, increase the interactions, and by doing that, we basically make this mod insulating state where we break up the Bose-Einstein condensate. We basically occupy each lattice site by one boson now. We lose the wave character. And in terms of the band filling, we basically have a coherent superposition of all log states in our energy band being occupied in the system. Okay? And now comes the trick. Now I suddenly switch my Hamiltonian from U to minus U, from repulsive to attractive interactions and my trap from a trapping potential to an anti-trapping potential. And I have to do that abruptly, non-adiabatically in the system. So what's happening? Well, basically, I turn my Hamiltonian H <coughs> into minus H. So every eigenstate I had before is going to be an eigenstate afterwards, but now not with energy E, but with energy minus E. Okay. So this is what we do. So out of the lowest energy in the system, we suddenly created the highest energy state in the system. And now when you ramp down the lattice and let the atoms tunnel again and come together, increase their kinetic energy, decrease their interaction energy, they have to form a superfluid, a Bose-Einstein condensate, but now not at the lowest energy of the system, but at the highest energy point in the system. And this highest energy point is, of course, now a condensate at the upper band edge of the system. Okay. So one thing to, to actually is, is, is peculiar is why is this whole thing stable even? You know, how, can, how come you, know, you, can, you have this anti-trap and, and your particles don't roll down the hill? I mean, why don't they escape our trap? We're not trapping them, we're anti-trapping them, okay? The reason why this is absolutely stable is because we have an isolated quantum system. You know, for this to happen, you have to be able to give up potential energy and convert it into kinetic energy. If you cannot generate kinetic energy, you cannot roll down this hill. And that's precisely what's happening here. Because you're already at the maximum point of maximum kinetic energy, you cannot generate more kinetic energy in the system. So you cannot go down the hill because your energy, kinetic energy, is already maxed out. So it's absolutely stable, anti-trapped, but absolutely stable sitting in the center of our trap, not being able to roll down, simply because it's isolated from the environment. If it would be, of course, connected to some phonons, Reservoirs in the system, it would immediately roll down the hill. Okay, it only works for the isolated quantum system. But why it's not uh, forming droplets as opposed to B, C? Same, same reason? I mean, because you have attraction now in that. It's, it has attraction also now in the system, yes. Um, but it's also, you know, it, it would just form, it, since we are in all the overall state, is the highest possible energy dense state in the system. Something that would have, uh, let's say, fragmentation would be a higher entropy <coughs> state. And that would be, in our picture, something on the little bit higher side of the entropy curve. Okay? So that would be a state uh, somewhere up here. Okay, so we're really already up here. And if you want to fragment the condensate, it would go somewhere here. Okay? But you have, again, you have no way to give up the energy. You've maxed out okay. all the energy yeah. channels, so you cannot create any other state in the system. Couldn't you just 
take the whole coordinate system, move it, and give it any amount of kinetic energy you wanted? Uh, to do what? So you want to, now you want to have a center of mass motion yep. of the system. Yes. But you could slosh it around it, then it would slosh around in the, tra the anti-trap. Like in, in, a, in a trap case, repulsive positive temperature, it would oscillate in your trap. This thing would then just slosh around as well. So no, nothing different. But if it sloshes, eventually it hits the edge, right? That negative, I can... Well, there's no edge and it's like harmonically trapped. So it, it would do just the same motion as, 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 a, as a positive temperature BC in a trapped harmonic configuration, okay? So this thing is, uh, just would do exactly the same thing but with this anti-trapping potential. All right, so let me show you pictures that this works. So we make a Bose-Einstein condensate. How we see that is through the interference pattern it generates uh, when you release it from this optical lattice. And then we drive it into this strongly interacting mod insulator state where now you lose the wave character and you have now single occupation of each of those lattice sites that I showed you on these pictures before, the quantum gas microscope pictures before. If we just ramp down the lattice again, you see we get the condensate back again. We get this interference structure back. But if we do the switching trick that I showed you before, we create u to minus u and v to minus v, we get also an interference pattern, but we get the one that corresponds to the Bose-Einstein condensate at the highest possible kinetic energy, say, at the upper band edge of the system, which is this distinct momentum space interference pattern that we create. And from this momentum distribution, actually, I can fit the temperature of the system so I can just take those pictures and just use, use my standard statistical physics formula, my Bose-Einstein distribution, uh, for the positive temperature, as I, you see, it fits beautifully, and I can determine the temperature. And for the negative temperature state, actually it fits, but with a negative temperature case. In this case, it turns out to be about minus uh, 2.2 nanokelvin in the system. This thing is completely stable, so we check the stability of this <coughs> negative temperature, negative, uh, this attractively interacting condensate, uh, and in contrast, to a positive temperature one. So if you take a positive temperature condensate, you make the attractions attractive, this thing collapses on you, okay? So this is uh, early experiments in uh, Carl Weimann's group where they did precisely that. They took a condensate, made the attraction, the interactions attractive, and the whole thing just collapses in, in, on you, implodes, basically. But if you do that with a negative temperature system, you can see that the lifetime of the system here characterized by the visibility of the interference pattern is for negative temperatures in red as high as the one for positive temperatures, even a slightly bit longer, okay? So it lives as long as what we have for positive temperatures there. <coughs> All right, so let me conclude with a few kind of comments on what the properties of the system are. So first of all, when we talk about stability of matter, we know that for matter to be stable, uh, ds over dv <coughs> has to be positive, right? So you basically generate uh, entropy as you basically increase the volume of your system. You expand, gas expands, for example. <coughs> um, so now, in using the first equation of thermodynamics, ds over dv is simply absolute pressure divided by absolute temperature. If the thing is stable, if ds dv is positive, and I showed you that the gas is stable, then that means we not only have a gas which has absolute negative temperature, but we also have a gas which has absolute negative pressure. Now, what does absolute negative pressure mean? Well, typically, in order you know, you compress a gas with positive absolute pressure, you have to perform work on it. Here's a gas where you have to do the opposite. In order actually to expand it, you have to perform work on the gas. Okay, so it has precisely the opposite. Also, if you uh, go to your Carnot engines and think about a Carnot engine that you realize between a negative temperature reservoir and a positive uh, one, uh, and you can calculate the Carnot efficiency, you see something interesting happens. This thing turns into a plus sign, meaning you can get Carnot efficiencies larger than one. So I'm not saying we're violating energy conservation here, and this is something to think about and maybe discuss in your next StatMec class. This is completely fine in the way it's defined here, the standard way gives you a kind of a larger than one efficiency in your uh, Cano engine. Um, what's also interesting is that in such a gas, you have also something like anti-friction. So typically, when we send an impurity through a gas with positive temperatures, it generates uh, entropy and loses its kinetic energy, <coughs> so basically heats up the gas. Okay? For a negative temperature gas, actually the opposite would happen. So the entropy increases, but remember when the entropy increases, actually the particle actually now accelerates, okay? So this would be something where you have something like anti-friction if you send an impurity 
through a gas of negative absolute temperatures in the system. Okay, finally, I just want to show, you know, temperature is something, you know, everybody on the street, you know, connects to when we were totally overwhelmed when we published this a few years ago. And, you know, this made a lot of splashes in the public. You know, we even made it into Fox News. Yeah, that is rather <laughs> amazing. And sure there were a lot of, you know, great efforts by, by colleagues <coughs> to explain this and uh, the ideas behind negative temperatures and what it means and, and so forth. I think what I actually find totally amazing is that there's these colleagues from Nottingham University, 60 Symbols, you might have heard about them. They have a very nice YouTube channel where they show, you know, kind of complex physics phenomena to, to layman person. And I think by now, even look the last time, over 840,000 people have looked, watched, and informed themselves about negative temperature. You know, I think that's really remarkable and fun to see the public so engaged in, in, in understanding <laughs> physics. Actually, the final thing I want to say, I want to come back to this question of, of, of this fundamental statistical physics. Because when we published this, we also got angry comments from some of our colleagues in Augsburg, Peter Henge, for example. This is all <coughs> wrong, you're all wrong, there, is no, there are no negative absolute temperatures. So what, is the, what are they talking about? First of all, what's that? What are they talking about? Okay. Well, what they're talking about, 1 over t is the SDE. That's right, that's correct. Question is, of course, what is the entropy you use? Which entropy should you use, actually, to, to do that? The one I use, the one probably you would have used, is microcanonical Boltzmann entropy, one we all learn about, the number of accessible microstates of the system in an energy shell E to E plus dE, logarithm of that. Okay? Now, there's another definition of entropy, which was put forth by Gibbs in his book that I showed in the beginning. Actually, he discussed both, so he didn't favor either one, but he also introduced another one, and this is what people call the volume entropy. And the volume entropy now, because it takes into account the states not only between energy shell E and E plus delta E, but all the states from zero energy up to energy E. Typically, you only invoke this as a trick to basically do calculations, because this is so hard to calculate anything with this. When you want to do analytical formulas, you do this trick. But actually, for a system with a finite energy spectrum, this actually has kind of consequences. And this has the consequence, for example, if you use this Gibbs entropy, then you do not have any negative absolute, tem negative absolute temperatures in the system. So they are really intimately connected to this Boltzmann surface entropy. Now, the reason why they argue, people like Peter Henge argue for the volume entropy is that they say that's the one that's also conserved, that gives the right Maxwell relations also for a very small, finite size system, whereas the Boltzmann entropy does not. The downside <coughs> is, of course, if you come from a modern statistical physics information science perspective, this has nothing to do anymore with the information entropy we like to use in statistical physics. You can immediately see that because the, the states which, you know, the pure states, the two pure states of the problem, one with maximum energy and minimum energy, have totally different entropies in this volume entropy, but ver the same entropy in the Boltzmann uh, entropy formula. Okay, so if you're coming like me and you say, okay, for me quantum mechanics is more fundamental, we use information theory to derive statistical physics, and from statistical physics we derive the laws of thermodynamics, you go with Boltzmann. If you are somebody like Peter Henge who says, no, thermodynamics are the most fundamental rules of nature, everything else has to obey them, then you might prefer this one and get rid of the notion of negative absolute temperatures. All right, so with that, I'll just leave it here and uh, just thank you for your attention. I you know, hope I showed you that these are wonderful systems to study many body physics. I could only, of course, discuss a few things of the many things that are going on in our labs. I just also want to thank the wonderful team of people. This is actually our ESC Synergy group. These are actually four, four teams, so it's not only my own group. This is a team of Ehud Altmann, John Dalibar, Peter Zoller, and uh, my own group in Munich. Uh, we were in Venice having one of our annual conferences there, who all you know, tr contributed tremendously to the work I've been showing you. I've been wonderful to work with all of them. And uh, with that, I'll leave you with this nice picture of Munich. Thank you very much. You said that this negative temperature exists because your quantum system is isolated. Then you said negative pressure means something about <coughs> work performed on, on the system. How can you perform work on something that is isolated? Well, you can expand. You can have the walls of a box 
You can confine it if in a box. If there are walls and box, it's not isolated. Why? If I have just the walls created by my laser beam, these are purely conservative forces, so it's isolated uh, from the rest. So these don't create any thermalizing processes. It's not coupled to some other positive reservoir, which would be disastrous, in fact, if you couple a negative temperature state of matter. But you can then sl slide down and generate kinetic energy of something that is coupled to your light field. Uh, but the light field is only coherent processes, so it doesn't create and doesn't allow me to buy to change energy in the system. I don't. It doesn't open another channel in which I can dump energy or receive energy from. This is different than a phonon bath, for example, if in a solid. Why doesn't this work in a solid? It doesn't work because you typically have phonons, for example. So, it's so you. I, I understand yeah. that. Yes. Yeah, but that means it's not just isolated. It's only coupled to a coherent source. That's your thing. Well, it's not. Doesn't have any energy exchange with the outside world. So it, it, the energy of the system, it, it cannot change its energy. It cannot give up energy or receive energy from the outside world. But no, because if you said no, if you expand it, you'll change its energy. You well, then I have to perform work, and right. that work has to be formed by my laser beam. So right. we have, uh, if we have this, that work, that energy has to come. <laughs> so there's actually a as as the opposite. If you have a positive temperature gas, let's imagine now right. I would take my laser beams and move them in on the gas, compress it. I have to also perform yeah. work on it. Where does that work come from? From my laser beams. So now my laser beams, in the process of moving, not when they're static, in the process of moving, they have to basically generate the energy. They have to give the energy to compress the gas. So that's just photons being exchanged in the medium that will then kind of give, give, give you that energy. But only in the process of compressing. Because in order to change the box wall, you have to change some say on AOD. For and example. And the atom can't example. bounce off of for the example, wall and change yeah. AOD. For example, yes. And now you can uh, do the reverse argument in negative temperature. Now you can move your walls outside and now further out, expand your system. And now it's actually something where in this expansion process you would have to give work, perform work on the system. Does that make sense? Yes, because the, because the walls can't move. Yeah. yeah. It is soft. So is, is there any way you can use your microscope to study systems where distortions of the lattice or phonons are important? Sure. I mean, we a priori, you see the lattice. First of all, the lattice we create through the light field doesn't have any phonons. It's a static lattice that we impose on the system. Now, there are two ways to do what you want to do. You can either use, immerse the species you're studying into, for example, a VC, which itself has phonons. So you have a two-component system. Or you can put the system in a cavity. And now the back action of the atoms onto the light field will make the light field move. So there's really a back action now. The atoms act as a refractive index on your light field and you can change the position of the standing wave as they move in the lattice. So for us, the beams are so intense that we generate, okay, the laser beams, that the lattice can be considered to be static. But in a cavity, you know, when, when, when the light field bounces several times back and forth between the atoms, it's several times a uh, chance to interact with the atoms. So the refractive index the dispersive phase shift of a single atom is weak. But when you traverse it millions of times, it can be significant. And then it can act like a phase shifter, so it will shift the phase of your kind of uh, optical lattice. So like that, you can introduce something like uh, a back action onto your light field and produce a moving a, a lattice which, which has phonons in this. But the first example is more like an Einstein solid. Would be completely static, yes. I mean, typically for us, that's what we want for now because we're only interested, we don't want the phonons, we just want to see what does the electronic system, for example, this Fermi Hubbard model, there are no phonons in the Fermi, Fermi Hubbard model. Okay, so what does that model give us? Okay. Okay, so one last question, Jeremy. So, just a curiosity, when we talk about temperature in these isolated systems, we tend to think that the sub part is thermalizing and using the reminder as a buff. Mm -hmm. So now in this case of negative temperature, what should the intent is happening to the reminder? That you are cooling it down, like in your example of friction? So let's say I do a quench or a drive in my isolated system in which I can bring a part of it to negative temperature. Am I bringing the reminder into the ground state instead of exciting it? What am I doing? Oh, well, if it's in thermal contact with a positive temperature reservoir, then it would immediately thermalize to no. positive temperature system. Or what do you want? What do you think of? What I'm trying to you think of a pure state, a strange pure state yes. where this yes. subsystem would have 
Yes. The way where my yes. subsystem it, would. Is the way we, we talk all the time to last years about terminal. I'm not sure that that can happen. I never thought about that configuration. So you're thinking about. I mean, and Jamir is asking so if you take a pure system, an isolated quantum system, and let's say that system is in an excited state. Let me, excited. I hope I'm getting right your question. Uh, so yeah, you're it's an right. excited state, some complicated excited, but it's a pure state. So this obviously has no temperature, right? I mean, it's a pure state of the system. Still, when we look at subsystems, so let, let's call this, this A and this subsystem B, if we look at subsystems and trace out part A of, 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 the, um, of the entire system or pure state, we actually will find that the density matrix of B of subsystem B is basically uh, has a thermal spectrum, has a thermal density matrix. Okay, and that's why we actually can use thermodynamics so well, that's why it works so well actually for most cases that we know. We, we don't have a proof of this, this is what's called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. We just find that in most of the systems we study, generic systems, this, this is what happens. So you can take a pure state, but if you look at the subsystem here, then you will find actually it has a thermal density matrix. And actually MBL, which we didn't talk about today, is a phenomena where this actually totally breaks down, uh, when you, where this does not work anymore. So you are asking, what is if this subsystem, can you have situations where this subsystem would have yes. negative temperature? Yes. I don't know, Frank. I didn't think about that. That's something I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> say something wrong okay. on. I didn't think about it. Uh, it's a good question. OK, so I think uh, we should stop now <coughs> and thank the speaker and meet upstairs for wine and cheese. Upstairs. Oh, I'm sorry, it's